If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the show. Now, in the final podcast in our short series on malarial parasites, we're going to look at the two less common species, Plasmodium malariae and Plasmodium ovale. Uh, in addition, we're going to spend some time talking about the so-called monkey malaria, Plasmodium nolesi. And joining me now to is my go-to parasitology expert, author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary. Thanks for talking Good to me. Good evening. Thanks for talking to me today. Um, yeah, no problem. Well, let's go ahead and start with uh, the two less common human malarias. Um, and let's start with Plasmodium malariae. And kind of uh, in one summation, can you talk about how common this is, where it's found, pathology, and uh, the morphological characteristics we might see microscopically? Sure. In my experience, Plasmodium malariae has been one of the less common ones that I have seen. Always lots of excitement when you find It's found in South America, Africa, and Asia, but a lot of cases go undetected, and it probably accounts for less than 10% of cases, you know, in those places where it's found. It's, uh, it has the usual symptoms when you have Plasmodium malariae. You have, tend to have a cyclical fever, chills and rigors where you suddenly feel very, very cold and start to shake and start to sweat. You can have a headache, some muscle and joint pain, and, and it rarely is serious, but it can damage your kidneys. It's one of the uh, species of malaria which doesn't tend to kind of hide out in your liver, so usually once you are treated for it, it doesn't recur. Uh, did I miss anything there? Um, the morpho- Oh, key morphological. Yes, yes. ma'am. Um, yes, the one thing that really stands out about malaria is that it tends to have these band forms. So you see the parasite stretched mm-hmm. from one side of the red cell to the other. And it's quite characteristic, but in as in all of these things that we look for in malaria, it's it does occur sometimes in other species, so it's not really a smoking gun, but it's always exciting to see that that stage. Malaria doesn't usually infect a large number of red cells because it tends to infect only the young, um, or sorry, the old, the older red blood cells, mm-hmm. so not all of them are available to it. Okay, let me ask you the same questions about the other species, Plasmodium ovale. Yes, Plasmodium ovale is famous for being present in sub-Saharan Africa, where it's quite common. And it's more widespread than that, but much rarer in other places. So it sort of shows up in a lot of the places where Plasmodium vivax does. There are apparently two subspecies. So now we talk about, you know, a fifth or even a sixth Plasmodium that infects people. It's generally uncommon, except where it is common, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And again, the, the, same, the usual symptoms of malaria, it tends to be less severe than any of the others. But again, in severe cases, it can do some organ damage. One thing that really stands out about ovale when you see it in a blood smear is that the infected red cells tend to be sort of icky looking. Their edges are described as being fimbriated, so they're ragged and they, they just kind of look like they're coming apart. That's one of the things if you do see a high percentage of cells that are oval and look kind of sticky like that, you tend to think about ovale, but as always, it uh, 
it can, that can be seen in other species as well, particularly vivax. So it can be hard to tell the two apart. It's one of the reasons why the molecular methods are very useful with malaria because it, it's, uh, it can give you a definitive answer when the morphology is, is not helpful. Okay, that's great, uh, Rosemary. Let's switch over to the monkey malaria, Plasmodium nolesi. And um, where is this parasite found geographically? And when was it first recognized as a human pathogen? It seems to have just popped up in the literature in the last 10 years or so. But in fact, we've known about Plasmodium nolesi for a long, long time. Uh, it's found, it's famous for being found in Malaysia, uh, especially Borneo, so Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. These are the places where we've seen some larger clusters of cases in recent years, but it is quite widespread throughout that region, and it was often missed in the past. But as I mentioned, the molecular methods are helping us to realize that it actually has been more common than we thought it was. It was probably first seen in the late 1920s or early 1930s, but we thought that it very rarely infected people. So we're just learning now that it's much more common than anyone believed. Yeah, and I was... It's probably artificially raised the the prevalence of Plasmodium malariae. You know, a lot of those cases in the past were oh. perhaps nolacy. Mm -hmm. Well, I was actually reading mm -hmm. an article a little while ago um, where it noted that uh, as much as 69% of all human malaria cases in Malaysia are caused by this strain. And it says, mm -hmm. it says that the number of cases has spiked from 376 in 2008 to over 1,600 in 2016, including eight deaths. Yes, eight deaths. So, yes, yeah. yes, it is sometimes fatal. So yeah. uh, much, it's much more common than we thought, and in some cases much more serious than we thought it was. Yes. Um, now, it's called monkey malaria for a reason. Uh, Rosemary, what animals do, does this species naturally occur? It naturally occurs in long-tailed and pig-tailed macaques. And they often don't have any symptoms of malaria. Although another type of macaque, although I don't know a whole lot about monkeys, but I gather that what we usually call a rhesus monkey is a type of macaque as well. And this plasmodian species often usually fatal in that type of monkey. So it does have its preferred host where it doesn't cause much of a problem. And, uh, but then it does jump to other hosts as well. Can you talk about the life cycle of this parasite? The life cycle is the same as the other the other malaria parasites. So you're bitten by a mosquito. When the mosquito bites, sporozoites are released into your bloodstream and they very, very quickly travel to your liver. They invade cells in the liver and go through a stage of asexual multiplication, finally bursting out into the bloodstream. And then they invade red blood cells. And again, they multiply and uh, it's an asexual stage of multiplication, eventually destroying the red blood cell, being released into the blood, invading new red blood cells, going through the whole cycle over again. And then finally, uh, sexual stages, gametocytes are formed, and these are the stage that if they are ingested by another mosquito that bites, they go through their sexual stage of multiplication in the mosquito to produce those sporozoites. So um, nolacy is different from some of the others in that it does not have a stage in the liver where it can hide in between bouts. Same as malaria, it doesn't either. And it has, uh, nolacy has a 24-hour fever cycle, which is the, sh the shortest fever cycle of the malaria parasite. So it comes around very quickly. And every time that fever spikes, the red cells are destroyed and releasing parasites into the bloodstream. Now, you mentioned that it's uh, confused with other human malaria infections. Um, is that because of how it appears microscopically, or is that because of its pathology or some combination of the two? Well, it's a combination of the two, but it's mostly because of the way it appears in a blood film. If you were to see a case of nolacy on a blood film, you might think that it was a mixed case of Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium malariae because it has features 
of both of those two. Notably, we see those band forms that we see in malaria, which would make most people kind of jump to that conclusion. You see all stages of the life cycle in the peripheral blood, which is not typical of falciparum. And the gametocytes are not typical of falciparum, but then again, you see those early ring forms, sometimes a very high parasitemia, so a lot of red cells infected, which is also typical of falciparum. Red cells with more than one parasite inside the cell, also falciparum, and double chromatin dots on those early ring forms. So, And those things would make you think falciparum. So you might lean towards a mixed infection. But apparently most times when it's misidentified, they call it plasmodium malariae. So I would imagine that molecular methods are very useful in identifying this. They are key, and they have been the key to realizing just how common this particular species is. Perhaps without the molecular methods, we might never have realized how much, how many cases there are of it. Mm -hmm. Now, how is uh, the monkey malaria treated? The drug of choice is chloroquine, much simpler than many of the other species. It's usually mm -hmm. sensitive to chloroquine, and that usually solves the problem because, as I mentioned, it doesn't hide in the liver, so we don't have to go after it again later. Okay, Rosemary, let's uh, go ahead and close with um, your interesting stories. Pick a species and uh, give us an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I have to choose Nolacy, and the, the thing that fascinates me about it is that Long before we knew it was causing all these human infections, we were actually using this species to treat people with syphilis. And this was happening through, uh, well, we started using Nolacy around 1937, but they were actually using Vivax before that time. So they didn't have a, an antibiotic at that time to treat people with syphilis, but they did know that it was very sensitive to high temperatures. So if they could infect somebody with something to cause a high fever, then sometimes they could cure the syphilis. And uh, this was done regularly. So Nolacy was a good choice, you see, because it had that 24-hour fever pattern. So you could get that high temperature much more often than you did with the other species. They thought it was relatively safe. And they could also keep it in the lab in monkeys. At that time, they hadn't been able to kind of keep the human uh, plasmodium species like Vivax alive in the lab in order to use it on people. So this was a real boon, finding something that they could actually keep in the lab in monkeys. So it was a great discovery for them. And they didn't, you know, they didn't um, realize how dangerous it could be. That's a really good one, Rosemary. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah, that was between 1937 and 1950. Around 1950, they started to phase it out. Yeah. Yeah, well, after after penicillin, obviously, yeah. Yes, yes. I think. Uh -huh. Well, thank you once again, Rosemary Drizdell, for your expertise and your time. I appreciate it very much. My pleasure, as always.